All right, good morning, everybody. Great to see you today. Welcome to St. Matthew. We are one body, two worship services, so I say good morning to you in the sanctuary as well. Uh, my name is Jeff Gale. If we haven't met, I'm associate pastor. Uh, pastor Rick's on vacation, so I get to continue the series this week on our series on prayer, and we're going to dive into getting some practical tools to, to help us pray in our personal life, and our corporate life. And before we get into that, I, I want to just kind of go back with you to the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, when God created, he created the heavens and he created the earth. He created everything in it and then he created you and me. He created humankind, man and woman, male and female in his image. And he said it was good, not just good, but very good. And there was a purpose for him creating human beings. And that purpose was to be in relationship with him and to be in relationship with each other. So the story goes, everything was great. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and God even walked with them in the garden. They were very close. They were, they were so close, they were like one. And he would speak to them and talk with them, and they would, they would share communion with him. But then something happened, and they messed up. They did wrong. They sinned, and they fell. And that part of the story is called the fall. And after, after they fell, after they messed up, and when they were in the garden, they didn't want to walk with God. They wanted to hide from God, didn't they? They wanted nothing to do with God. They wanted to make sure God wasn't aware of where they were and what they were doing. And they didn't realize that no matter where they went, God pursued them. And God saw them, and God knew them, and God loved them anyway. And here we are, thousands of years later, and so many of us are still living our lives like Adam and Eve after the fall. We're hiding from God. We're, we're, we're keeping a distance. We don't, we don't want that, that, that personal relationship because we're not sure how we're supposed to act with God. We're not sure we know what to say when talking to God. And when we talk about prayer, it's that communication in that context of relationship that is so critical to a healthy relationship. But when we communicate, we got to know the, the, the language and the words. And so we're going to go there this morning. We're going to go there a little bit. But you think about language for a second in any relationship and how we present ourselves. And, and there's a difference between how we present ourselves at the beginning of a relationship and deeper into a relationship. Think about a job interview. You go to a job interview and, 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 and you go online and you say do's and don'ts for job interviews. And they say, wear this, don't wear this, say this, don't say that, do this with your hair, don't do that with your hair. I mean, all these rules. Why? Because you want to project this image of what the company's looking for. You don't necessarily want to project yourself because that might not get you. You want to give them what they want. If you're courting, if you're dating, oh my gosh, going back when I was chasing my wife. I chased her till she caught me, right? And it took a long time. But man, I mean, I was, I, I, I tried to be perfect. My posture was always good. My language was right. I was, I mean, trying to do all the right things. Why? Because I wanted her to go out with me. And then I wanted to, to ask her to marry me. And, and we got engaged. And, and I said, I'm, I'm almost there. This is great. This is great. And then we got married. I was like, yeah, I did it. And then the honeymoon was over. And she didn't say it, but it was like she was saying, and who are you? Because when the honeymoon's over, our guard is down, we're relaxed, we're more ourselves. If you get that job that you were interviewing for a few months in, you have a stress blow up, right? And they go, oh, that's the real you. You see, our, our relationships are different as we get to know each other as we go further in. And when we go to God, some of us are still like in that job interview stage, like, oh, yes, Lord. 
You know, I, I don't know what language you had in your life, if you were uh, from a home that, that was uh, of believers or not, but in my home growing up, some of the older members of the family, when it came time to, to pray around a table at a meal, all of a sudden their language changed. You know, they're talking like you and me talk all the time, but then, then in that prayer, they started using King James English. And they'd say thee and thou and art and ibeth, stuff like that. And I was confused. I thought, is that the language God speaks? So I didn't know. What language do we use when we talk to God? And the disciples, when they were following Jesus, even they, men of faith, believers in God, they said to Jesus, teach us, God. Teach us, Lord, how to pray. And he teaches them. And I'm going to share that with you in a minute, but, but I want to go to Luke. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 11. We're not going to project this. We're going to read it together. And, and I want you to go to verse 5, chapter 11, verse 5 in Luke. Read along. If you don't have a Bible, listen for the Word of God. Jesus is... is telling them how to approach God in this, in this scene. He said, he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door's already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. There's a situation. But Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. In other words, you know, that, okay, you're the guy that needs something or the, the girl that needs something. You go to your friend, hey, knock, knock, knock. I, I need a favor. I need something from you. And your friend says, sorry, I can't help you right now. Call me in the morning. You can either say, okay, and go away, or Jesus instructs, keep knocking. Do, 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 do. I know, I need it now. Do, 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 do. You're not going back to sleep until I get it, buddy. Come on, help a brother out, right? Jesus is saying, be persistent. He goes on to say, so I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We're not to hide from God and wait for Him to pursue us. We pursue God. Not just in words, but in our lives. In our lives, every day, as we walk, we walk with God as though he is with us, because he is with us. And when we need something, we turn to God. Here are the words he says. Go back to verse 1 now, chapter 11, verse 1. You don't even need to turn, turn the page, most of you. It says, he was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. That's what we call the Lord's Prayer. If you grew up in a church, in church tradition, you recognize it. I grew up in a traditional church, and it was like every week we would say this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Using the King James English, why? I do not know. But for some reason, the Lord's Prayer in the 23rd Psalm today remain with us in that kind of language. And I had to say it all the time, and, and, and I was even tested at the age of 12 to make sure I knew it before I could even join the church. And it got to the point where, where it was my prayer, basically, and I couldn't even go to sleep at night unless I had said that prayer. But what I was doing was I was just going by rote memory. 
And I would, I, I would just go through the words, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be. And I didn't even know what some of them meant. Here was my primary prayer. I'm praying to God. I wasn't even sure what I was saying. I wonder how many of you had that similar experience. If you don't know that prayer, it's important to know it. And here's why. Because it's the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. It's not just a traditional church ritual. It's not just something that, that traditional church people do. It is the Lord's prayer. It is the words that Jesus says to say when we pray. And there are so many different versions. Every translation of the Bible is a little bit different. But the one that's most familiar to, to us in Christianity is still that King James, our Father who art in heaven. So I want to take some time, and I want, to, I want us to know that prayer. I want us to learn that prayer if we don't know it. But I want to know not just the words of the prayer, but the essence of the prayer and the meaning behind what we're saying. So that when we pray it ourselves, alone or in community, we understand what we're saying. And as we teach our children in the next generations, you know, how to pray, you cannot go there how to pray without addressing the Lord's Prayer. Because Jesus' own disciples said, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, this is it. So it starts, our Father who art in heaven, our Father in heaven. And on your notes, we've just listed the prayer with space around it to the sides and in between. I want you to make your own notes, whatever pops out, just, just to help you remember and trigger in your mind what you need for this prayer in your life. Our Father in heaven. Okay, let's, let's talk about the big word Father first. Because a lot of people have a problem with this language, this term father for God. Because the Bible tells us that, that both uh, man and woman, male and female, were created in his image. The Bible tells us that God is not flesh, but God is spirit. So as we were created in God's image, it is that spiritual part of us that reflects the essence of God. God is not a man, flesh, and blood. God is spirit. So this term father, which so many people have a hard time with, and the reason they have a hard time and understand it's their experience of father is not very godlike. And for some, their experience of father is nothing, anything they, they want their God to be like. So you say, Father God, and they say, no, thank you. Because all they can experience and see in their mind is this image of Father that is broken. But remember, it's our Father in heaven. It is not that God is like an earthly Father. God is a heavenly Father. And so if you have a hard time with that term, just think of the, the best Father imaginable that you wish you, you had and how perfect that father is, and, and what are the essence points of that person, and then factor that to an infinite degree, and you're still not there with what God is, because God is perfect. The thing we need to take away from this line is that in our prayer, we go to God in intimacy. Write that down. Intimacy. Our Father in heaven. We go to God in an intimate way. This was a radical statement to the, the, these followers of Jesus because they didn't understand God as Father. God is a, a cold-hearted, distant judge ready to curse you or bless you depending on what you did. But Jesus is saying, no, it's not like that at all. This God loves you, cares for you, desires relationship for you, desires the best for you. You can trust him. He is your Father in heaven. And then we say, hallowed be thy name, hallowed. That was one of those words. What is that, hallowed? It means holy. Holy is your name, God. We go to God and write this down, with respect or reverence. We go with intimacy, we go with respect and reverence. The word God, the word Lord, they're tossed around in our culture like they mean nothing. But to us who follow, 
who believe those words, those names mean something. And they are to be revered and, and held dear and held close and not to be tossed around as they mean nothing. And we call that using the Lord's name in vain. But it's much more than just saying the words. Because remember, this isn't just about a prayer and saying words. It's about our lives. And when we live our lives, we're living them prayerfully. We're living them as reflections of who God is. And whenever you do things in your life, in the name of faith or in the name of Jesus or in the name of God, if that is not aligned with the will of God and what God would have us do, then that itself is using the Lord's name in vain in an extreme fashion. But we say, holy is your name, God. Holy is your name. And our words and our lives reflect the holiness of that company we keep in God. And then what do we say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Kingdom, what kingdom? What kingdom? When we say kingdom, what we're referencing is this holy realm, this spiritual realm where God reigns, where God is the king, where God is, is standing and, and, and lording over this kingdom. It is the kingdom of God that we are subjects of, that we are citizens of. We're not just citizens of our country. But we proclaim citizenship in the kingdom of God because we are part of God's work. And in that, we recognize that God employs us to do his work. We are the body of Christ, we say, right? The hands, the feet, the eyes, the ears, the voice of Jesus in the world. And this kingdom that God is building, we are partnering in that work. Notice that we're not praying let the rapture come, O oh God, and take me out of here. Please don't let me be left behind. We're not asking for escape. Jesus doesn't teach us that prayer. He teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, O oh God. Your kingdom, not our kingdom. Your kingdom where you are the power, not us. And that our citizenship in that kingdom is primary over all other allegiances. And that it is his will, his love, his guidance that informs the decisions we make in our worlds. And then we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God is on the throne in the kingdom of heaven, right? Right? And we recognize that, 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 that God is the ultimate authority. And we're praying that, that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what we're saying? In that realm of spiritual bliss of heaven, who's the boss? God, right? And in that place, if God says jump, we jump. If God says, let there be, then there is. And we're asking God to exercise his will on earth in our experience, in our existence, in the same way it's experienced in the heavenly realm. But what's the reality? What's the reality? You think about your bosses. If your boss says jump, you jump. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to get fired. Your boss says do something, yes ma'am, yes sir, right away. I mean, there's no argument, there's no debate. You go, you do it. Our bosses have more authority and influence over us than our family members, our friends, and yes, I would even say in some cases, God, because our friends and family tell us to do something. Oh, let's talk about that a little bit. I'm not sure. Let's negotiate. Let's come to some agreement. God tells us to do something. Well, I don't think so. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Come on, really, Lord? Really? I'm not sure I can do that. Our bosses say do something, yes, right away. God says to do it. 
We're like rebellious children. I miss those days when my kids were so young. Oh, when they're toddlers. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, these, little, these little ones, they, they see dad and you're like, God, you can do no wrong. You can say no wrong. Whatever you do, whatever you say is. And moms, whatever you do, whatever you say, the, the love that, that they experience through you, that is like the love of God to them. I mean, there is nothing else. It's you. Those were good days. And then 13 comes. And it's over. What happens? But we're like that 13-year-old with God, you know? We're rebellious. We don't want to do what God says. And yet in this prayer, in this prayer, we're saying, your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Without the readiness or willingness to respond to what he's saying to do. You see how we've used this prayer. Those of you who've said it in your growing up, in your, in your lives, we don't even know what we're praying, what we're asking, but this is the prayer that Jesus says to pray. Lord, teach us to pray, okay? Here you go. Pray this. All right. And we do it, but do we really know what we're asking? And then we say, give us this day our daily bread. This is where we ask for what we need. This is what, the stuff. The last one, you could put order by there, thy will, the, the order, the right order of things. And before that, expectation. Thy kingdom come as we expect this kingdom to happen. We expect change to occur. When we, we accept the authority of God, we're asking for the right order of things. Give us this day our daily bread. We're asking for provision. You can write down provision. It doesn't say when you pray to God, ask for a comfortable retirement. It doesn't say uh, pray for things that are going to happen in the future or not. It says give us this day, this day, today, the only day that God has given us, our daily bread, our food, our clothing, our shelter. That's what we need to live, right? And we also need the tools and resources to do the work that God is calling us to. We need minds that can read to read scripture. We need mouths to share the gospel. We need the things that are about God's work today. Today. But oh, the things we think we need that we just don't need. I used to pray as a kid, God, give me that bike for Christmas. Oh, it'd be so awesome. Please, God, please, please, please. I still continue to pray for things. As a young adult, back to chasing my wife, you know, I, I prayed fervently, God, let her be the one. Please let her be the one. I still pray for these things. Not that other women be the one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. It's, it's, we pray for, for the outcomes that we desire. But what we need, I need, I need new technology. <laughs> That's my thing. You know, I was made aware of this this week when uh, my kids had these experiences. My, my daughter, 13, she, she, uh, we'd found some VHS tapes in, in, in our closet that had been put away for years. And it hadn't occurred to me that she hadn't experienced VHS tapes in her life. And there was a movie she was watching. She left the room, came back to it. It had gone all the way to the end. She stopped it. She started rewinding it. She goes, Dad. Do I have to sit here and wait for the whole thing to go all the way back to the beginning before I could start again? I was like, wow, this is new to you. And I remember she was feeling a need. She was needing chapters or something. And I remember when DVDs came out. Oh, how cool is that? I cannot live with this VHS anymore. I need my DVDs. Need. My son had four wisdom teeth pulled this week. 
and an implant. And this was Thursday, and the, the, the nurse calls me back. He said, okay, he's beginning to wake up. You can come back now. So I, I went, and I sat next to him in, his, in the chair. And, and uh, first comprehensible words out of his mouth were, I need my phone. <laughs> I need my, I need, I need my phone. <laughs> Anybody get some strange texts from my son this week? Uh, just <laughs> delete them. Need. What do we need? What do we need? We want so much. What does Jesus tell us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Keep us alive today, God, that we can experience you in the life that you've given us and do your will. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then what do we say? And forgive us. Forgive us. Put confession next to this. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Some of us remember it. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Others forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The most accurate uh, translation is, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And the debts and debtors thing, just to comment a little bit, that was a prayer that, that our debts literally be forgiven and we forgive others and we start clean, zero balance. But it's the same thing with the sins. But here's the problem with this phrase that I run into, and it's a, very, it's a big challenge for me because I'm praying Forgive us our sins, God, as we forgive those who sin against us. And it's not, forgive me of all the bad things I've ever done, Lord, and I'll consider forgiving everybody else too. It's forgive us, God, our sins in, in the same way. In the same way that we forgive others. That's a little harder. You can say, judge me, God, in the same way that I judge others. You see the toughness there? Because we can be a judgmental people. We can be an unforgiving people. And Jesus tells us, pray to God, that you be forgiven in the same way that you forgive. If you want to be forgiven, then forgive. If you don't want to be judged, then don't judge. The Bible even says, do not judge lest you be judged. It's not just the words, it's about our lives. Prayer is communication, it's relationship. It's not just the words. We confess to God our brokenness, just like we confess in our relationships. Honey, I did this and I was so wrong, I'm really sorry, I need you to forgive me. And if there's a forgiving relationship there, it's going to happen. So do you live a grace-filled life? You will receive an overabundance of grace in your life. But if you're sitting on a throne of judgment, you're asking for the same in return in this prayer. And then we say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here we are, are, are praying for, for protection and deliverance. Protection and deliverance. We're asking that God not place us in a position where we are prone to fall. But because we do fall, sometimes we find ourselves in a pit Sometimes we find ourselves in despair and brokenness in a way that we see no way out that only God can, can, can save us from. Deliver us, O oh God, from evil. Deliver us from the snare of the evil one. Deliver us, O oh God, from this life that is no good, that does not honor or glorify you, and bring us to a new life. Because that's what we're asking for. 
Don't put us in a position we're going to fall, fall Lord, but, but, but when we have fallen, save us. Save me. And then we say, we recognize where the good comes from. We give God the credit when we say, for thine is the power and the glory forever. The kingdom is yours, God. The power is yours, God. And the glory is yours, God. All things that are good, all things that are worthy of living for come from God. And we realize that. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own successes and, and, and we try to, to, to give God the glory when, when we should. And, and a lot of times, sports, I love, I love this in football games, you know, when, when, when the, the winning team says God was with us, you know, implying that the other team didn't have God, that, that it was God's desire that the saints, of course, would win. I saw a cartoon where Guy was running for a touchdown. He says, this is for you, Jesus. And Jesus is off to the side watching a hockey game. <laughs> you know? But the point is, it doesn't matter what you do in your life so much as who you are in what you do. Follow your passions. Follow your dreams. Do the career that you, you want to do, the work you want to do. But in that work, whatever it is, glorify God. Glorify God so that the world can see God through not what you're doing, but who you are. Who you are. Now this week, I want you to spend time in this prayer. As we're going through this season of prayer together, as this body, in, in your individual prayer time and in your groups, we want you to go through the life steps. We want you to, 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 to dig into these phrases and, and, and look up different versions. Look up different versions online because there are a lot of different wordings of the Lord's Prayer. But those, those qualities that we attach to each one of them, when you pray, use your own words. Make it real. Make it genuine. It's you that God wants. Not so much your words, and he knows what you need to say before even you do. Just go to God and be in his presence. It's an intimate relationship. And revere his name. Pray with expectation that your life and the world will be different because of this relationship that you have. Pray that God be the ultimate authority in your life and submit to that authority. Stop being a rebellious kid. Pray for God's provision. Pray for the desires of your heart, but understand what you need to live the life that God wants you to live. And confess your sins to him. Show him you recognize the wrongs that you've done and ask him not to lead you into those places where you will fall, but when you have, to take you out. And remember who he is and who you are in that relationship. Jesus gives us the tools so often just in the stories he tells. He teaches us to pray and he teaches us to remember our place with him when we come to this table of Holy Communion that, that is set for you and for me. And as we prepare to come to this table in just a moment, I think it would be most appropriate if we together, sanctuary and ark, go to God in prayer by joining together in saying the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was 2,000 years ago, and Jesus was in that upper room with his best friends, his disciples, his students, the, the ones that, that were most close to him. And, and he was changing everything. After he, he, you know, they were doing the Passover meal together, and they, there was a ritual, there was a routine and an understanding, but Jesus changed it, turned it upside down, turned it on its ear, because this time, after he blessed the bread and gave thanks, he, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup, okay, this is the, this is the new covenant, the new agreement, the new deal. The old one was of law, this one is of grace. And it's sealed in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. So whenever you drink of this, do this also in remembrance of me. We thank you, God, for your blessings, and we ask them upon this bread and this cup, that as we prepare to partake of this, that, that you examine us, and you change us, and you make us new again. That as we taste the bread and the juice, we remember who we are and whose we are in Jesus Christ. Amen. The purpose of St. Matthew, Cumberland Presbyterian Church, is to glorify God and share the love and grace of Jesus Christ with as many people as we can. And how shall we fulfill this purpose? By, by ministering to spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. By providing Christian relationships in the family of God. And by providing the challenge for individual and collective spiritual growth. Amen. Go in peace, everybody. Have a great week. Amen.